evening, everyone. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. Thank you for your patience. Welcome to this installment of the Harper Speaker Series. We started the series in 2007, and since then, the Harper community has enjoyed listening to experts and visionaries in a variety of fields and disciplines in this, in this beautiful space, and we're so glad you joined us this evening for Silicon Valley Dreams. It's become a tradition at the Harper Speaker Series for us to have one of our students introduce our distinguished guests. So in keeping with that, I'd like to, in a moment, hand the podium over to Emily Wang. And because uh, Emily's a senior, and I know this is going to embarrass her, but I'm going to do it anyway, Emily is herself an award-winning writer, which is exciting for us. This just happened this week, or last week. The Scholastic Art and Writing Awards are the longest running and most <coughs> prestigious recognition program for creative teens in the United States. And last week, Emily, along with 11 other Harper seniors, were gold key award winners in the regional category. Emily's category was in the personal essay memoir. So we're really, really proud of her for her recent achievement in that. I also just found out that as soon as you exit these doors, if you look immediately to your right, the five installation, the five piece installation on, of art on the wall is also Emily's. So she's one of the talented young women. So thanks again for coming, and please welcome Emily Wayne. Introduction. <laughs> um, tonight we are happy to present a conversation with poets Brian Turner and David Sullivan, moderated by Parthenia Hicks, the poet laureate Emer Emerita Los Gattis. Brian Turner is often called the soldier poet because he was an infantry team leader in Iraq. David Sullivan teaches in Santa Cruz at Cabrillo College and writes many voices about the war in Iraq, although he himself has never been a soldier. These two powerful poets know each other, and we are excited to hear them for the, for the conversation tonight. And now I'd like to introduce Angelica Ramsey, the Chief Academic Officer for the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and one of the three co-chairs for Silicon Valley Reads. Please welcome Angelica Ramsey. Tonight is really special for me for two reasons. One, I am a veteran of the US Army, and second, um, an educator to be in this beautiful facility. I'm very envious of how beautiful the facility was, is uh, as a past high school principal, uh, I already took pictures so I could send back to some of my ex-students. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening everyone and welcome to Poetry from War, part of Silicon Valley Reads 2013, The Invisible Wounds of War. Presented by the Santa Clara County Office of Education, the Santa Clara County Library District, San Jose Public Library Foundation and the Commonwealth Club Silicon Valley. My name is Angelica Ramsey and I'm the Chief Academic Officer for the Santa Clara County Office of Education and one of the three co-chairs for Silicon Valley Reads. Silicon Valley Reads is now celebrating its 11th year and we could not have succeeded without the generous support from our partners, community organizations, and donors. So I'd like to acknowledge some of our top tier sponsors the Knight Foundation, the Michael and Elise Parsons Foundation, the Cupertino Library Foundation, the Pacific Library Partnership, Cisco Systems, Friends of Cupertino Library, the San Jose Fairmont Hotel, the Mercury News, Silicon Valley Community Newspapers, and more than two dozen other foundations, businesses, and community organizations from around the county for their support. They're all listed on the back cover of our calendar events and also all of our dedicated community advisory board members. So during these three months, we'll be hosting more than 100 events and discussions throughout Santa Clara County focused on this year's theme, The Invisible Wounds of War. And our selected books, The Long Walk, A Story of War and Life that Follows by Brian Kastner, and Mind Feels of the Heart, A Mother's Stories of Her Son at War by Sue Diaz, and four other children's companion books, Night Catch, by Brenda Erman Trout, Nubs, The True Story of a Mutt, A Marine, and Miracle, by Brian Dennis, Kirby Larson, and Mary Nethery. <coughs> Back Home, by Julia Keller, and Purple Heart, by Patricia McCormick. I hope you all take advantage of these wonderful opportunities by picking up a calendar this evening uh, and, or visiting our website. So we'll now start our formal part of tonight's program, which is also being recorded by the Harker School. For this reason, we ask that all cell phones please be turned off. 
During tonight's program, we will have time for your questions. We encourage you to write them on the question cards that you were handed as you walked in this evening, and our volunteers will pick them up throughout the program. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce the authors of Silicon Valley Reads selections, Brian Turner and David Sullivan. Brian Turner earned a Master's of Fine Arts from the University of Oregon and lived abroad in South Korea for a year before serving seven years in the US Army. He was deployed to Bosnia Herzegovina in 1999 through 2000 with the 10th Mountain Division. Then in November 2003, he was an infantry team leader for a year in Iraq with the 3rd Striker Battalion Combat Team, the 2nd Infantry Division. His first book, Here, Bullet, chronicles his time in Iraq. Turner has been featured on National Public Radio, The News Hour with Jim Lauer, and the BBC. He has received an NEA Literature Fellowship in Poetry, the Amy Lal Traveling Fellowship, and a fellowship from the Lannan Foundation. Turner has taught English at Fresno City College. David Sullivan's first book, Strong Armed Angels was published by Hummingbird Press, and two of its poems were read by, the Garrison, by Garrison Keller on the Writer's Almanac. Every Seed of the Pomegranate, a multi-voiced manuscript about the war in Iraq, was published by Talbot Bach. He's currently finishing a manuscript about his father's dementia called Black Ice, and co-translating the poems of Iraqi Adnan al Sayak. He's been nominated for a push cart, won the Blood Root Poetry Contest, and had his poems become a part of the public poetry garden created in South Phoenix, chosen and read by Alberto Rios, and recently was awarded $1,000 in the Mort Marcus Memorial Poetry Contest, judged by Aliyan. He teaches at Cabrillo College, where he edits the Porter Gulf Review, with his students and lives in Santa Cruz with his love, the historian Sherry Barkley, Barkey, and their two children, Jules and Mina. Moderating tonight's conversation is Parthenia M. Hicks, the Poet Lariat Emeretta of Los Gatos. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Brian Turner, David Sullivan, and Parthenia Hicks. <laughs> without a face or name attached. We're sheltered from the graphic images and descriptions that make up the moment-by-moment -moment drama of war to such a degree that we dissociate from it and unfortunately are not always even aware of it. We understand intellectually that not only soldiers, but civilians on both sides of any conflict are suffering and living lives that will forever be changed by war. But we rarely have the opportunity to translate this into faces and names. It is often through the voices of our artists, through story and through poetry, that we begin to hear the deeper truth, the story behind the story, the faces, the names, the details of the lives who walk the territory of war. Tonight, it is my great honor to engage two wonderful poets, Brian Turner and David Sullivan, in a conversation about their work work that gives us a glimpse into some of the lesser known stories of war and its aftermath. So welcome, Brian and David. Thanks for having us here. <laughs> <laughs> we finally met this afternoon after emailing for quite a while. 
long time, so, so this, is, this is a little love fest here. <laughs> I'm going to start with Brian. Brian, you have been called a soldier poet, but I happen to know that you've been writing stories since childhood. When did you know that writing was going to be a serious part of your life? Um, after I decided that maybe the band wasn't going to take off. George <laughs> Mann. <laughs> yeah. Did so, everybody hear that? Yeah. Oh, can you say that again? Sure. Such a um, great answer. Well, when I was, in the, I was a teenager, I had hair down to here and um, had a little skeleton earring, sometimes a scuba diver, play bass in a band. I still play bass. And uh, uh, I started taking poetry classes thinking they would help me write lyrics for the band. We would tour Europe and stuff like that. But that never quite happened. You know? And um, I, I shouldn't say after that. I should say during that process. I was walking across campus in uh, Fresno State, and um, I was a machinist putting myself to college. A little help, some help from my family, and um, this, uh, there was a fine poet who handed me, uh, another student, who handed me this, uh, this poem, uh, They Feed, They Lion, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of knocked my socks off, and you know, it still does, but um, it made me think, how does he write like this? <laughs> it was this language I, I'd never seen before, but I knew very well. Yeah. But I, I wanted to know, I wanted to be around that more and see how do you, how do you write like this. Thank you. Well, how does a poet and an MFA student become a member of the military? What happened in your life to cause you to make that decision? Well, um, I think it goes, I don't, I don't know, I mean, within the question is a kind of a presumption that, that poets wouldn't go to war, mm -hmm. right? Um, that you're sensitive, so you wouldn't also be a warrior. The warriors aren't sensitive. Maybe, I don't know. You know, there are tangents on that that um, if you follow, I'm not sure if, if I always agree with them necessarily. So at least in, I thought I was not duck in my family. I, I thought my family was not duck, so in general. And that I come from a long military background, so, uh, you know, most of the men have served in my family in one branch of service or another, going back to like, the American Civil War, right? And then um, some of the women as well. So. Um, yeah, but my, I come from cattle ranchers in Fresno, up in the valleys. I say Fresno so people can kind of locate me, but they're, you know, at least still, part of the family still has cattle up in the foothills there. And so my uncle, who was a Vietnamese, he was a linguist in Vietnam. And um, but when he came back, he also, he ran the cattle and he taught drama at the local high school. So when he came down to see me, you know, the people that are my, the people, my mentors, he's handing me poetry because he knows I'm not getting that in school. But he's also a guy who fought in Vietnam, you know. So it's like I come from that kind of family where we're very complicated people, yes. as, we have, as we all are as a culture. Yes. Well, tell us how your um, private journals in Iraq became your first book of poetry, Peter Bullet. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if you did. I forgot I was going to ask you this earlier, too, if you, if you write a journal in your regular writing practice. I'd yes. love to know. Okay. I, I do that same thing, and it's uh, I journal all the time. Well, not every day or anything, like but throughout my life I have. And I knew I would when I went to Iraq. Um, and then, if you looked at the journals, if you flip over the pages, you'd see somebody so exhausted that I don't know if you've done this before, where maybe you have a notebook on your chest and you kind of write, and um, you wake up the next morning, you can see lines written on top of the other lines, right? You can't even read what it is, or sometimes you can. Or you're kind of lost ink, so it's just yeah, it's scratch marks. Or you have a big blurry blotch right there. <laughs> That so, and then eventually, uh, after as the adrenaline and exhaustion sort of evened out um, after the first few weeks in country, uh, then the poems, or couplets, and little lines started to appear. I realized they were poems, so I put them in another notebook, and I kept that in my assault pack, and then continued with that. The notebooks I'd fill and I'd mail them home to my, my folks. Mm. Well, that was my next question. I've heard you say before that. You periodically mailed your notes uh, and your journals home. So I was, I'd like to know, who did you send them to? I think you just sent your parents. Yeah, my mom, yeah, but at the same time, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question because, uh, you know, one, in the, in the U.S. mail, they're getting this very, maybe, well, these strange notebooks you can't hardly read, right? Um, with, all, with the events of the day as I saw them from my perspective within mm -hmm. the macrocosm, you know. But, uh, at the, I would call them on the phone periodically, and it was a completely different conversation. Oh, yeah, I'm doing great. Yeah, we're going to go to the PX. I'm going to try and get a CD. You know, um, that kind of conversation. Pick up Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9 11. 
which I did. They had it on the racks. And somebody ordered it in the U.S. military distribution system, and sitting there in the rack on the, on the rack was a, uh, Michael Moore's friend. Right so were your parents reading the journals, or were they setting them aside for you? I'm sure they read them. I've never asked them. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, tell us what effect your journaling writing your observations, what effect did that have on your own psyche while you were in Iraq? It was hard for me to tell at the time, um, but I think now Sergeant Turner, which is who I was for several years, um, that's too small of a space for a person to live in. You know what I mean? As the roles that we all have, we have you know, mother, father, brother, sister, coworker, each of those roles is too small for our, our, the actual person we are. And the same was true for Sergeant Turner. That's just a small, and it was a persona anyway, so it wasn't really this natural, you know, Sergeant Turner was, I'd have to be, see, I speak of him in third person, you know what I mean? Um, it was a character, because um, I had to get a job done. So I had to be a very different person. And I had to be, so I'm starting to slowly take on the persona of Sergeant Turner. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think the journals were a space where the imagination could roam free of it. You know? It was, it was mostly a space of witness, just trying to remember like what happened today. Because I knew I'd forget. We were just we were moving too much and doing too much, and I'd just lose the, much of the year to, to exhaustion and the sheer amount of you know, the moments that we were living. Would you read to us the uh, title poem of your collection here, Bullet? Sure. Well, that must have been sitting down and kind of weird reading a poem, but you know, I want to try it. I want to see how this, you know. Oh, did I drive someone out? No? Okay. <laughs> 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 right. This might be, uh, I forget the sound guy's name up here. What's the sound guy's name? Do we know? Do you have a, what's the problem? Well, no, I just want to let him know this might be a little louder than I am right now. So you know, Oh, it's great. Out. We're good. I don't want to do a headache. You've got it's some. It's a really nice guy helping us out up here. He's trying. <laughs> this is called Hear a Bullet. If a body is what you want, then here is bone and gristle and flesh. Here is the clavicle snapped wish, the aorta's open valves, the leap thought makes at the synaptic gap. Here is the adrenaline rush you crave, that inexorable flight, that insane puncture into heat and blood. And I dare you to finish what you've started, because here, bullet, here is where I complete the word you bring, hissing through the air. Here is where I moan the barrel's cold esophagus, triggering my tongue's explosives for the rifling I have inside of me, each twist of the round spun deeper. Because here, bullet, here's where the world ends every time. So I, I, you know, I folded that up. I wrote it in about 12 or 15 minutes. I folded it and put it in a Ziploc bag. I carried it inside my chest pocket the rest of the time that I was in country. Uh, and I remember thinking, because I knew the mortuary affairs guy. I'd taken a class with him. I was a mortuary affairs specialist for the company. And I remember thinking, you know, if I was killed, my body would be processed through him. Um, he was down in Kuwait originally, but it got so busy that they moved him up to where we were. And, um, and I just remember thinking that'd be a weird moment for him if, that, if he somehow opened up that Ziploc bag with the poem in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you have a series of poems that are called Dreams from the Malaria Pills. Yeah. And can you tell us a little bit about that? And also, I'm going to ask you if you would read the one that has your name in the title. Yeah, I can look at the page on that. I'm going to do that uh, twice here, but it's no problem. Um, the, I guess I really do need glasses. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing. I, got to, I survived so that now I need to wear glasses, you know? Let's come home. So, um, yeah, when we were there, we had to take these malaria pills because it, you know, it's possible to get it. Um, it, was a, remember, it was a pretty strong medication. It was a once a week pill. Um, and it seemed like about two out of every ten had like a bad reaction, so they'd have to get up there on a daily pill. Like uh, Bosch, my rifleman, um, I think the squad leader, he, he had to switch to. He had a very, I had vivid dreams, but I guess they had amazing dreams, you know. I remember there's a poem here about Bosch, in one of his dreams, because I was his team leader. So his job, let's say if there's something wrong with his body, because he's like a piece of equipment when it comes down to it, so, as, just as I was. So he has to come to me and tell me his dream. Which was pretty weird, and then uh, you know, as dreams can be, and then uh, we, the two of us, had to go to my boss, uh, squad leader, and then all three of us had to go to the platoon sergeant, tell the same dream, 
at this point, myself and Bosch are being choir while so I later tell us in the dream that it's gone from him to me to him. Now the platoon sergeant. And then the platoon sergeant said, well, pff, are you going to talk to me? Take him to the medic. You know? But if you don't talk to him, you know, it all rolls down. Um, um, yeah, these poems, um, they were, for me as a writer, it felt like an access point where I could go into the dream landscape. Because there was such a um, very visceral, very, uh, very solid, very direct and spare world most of the time. But um, I think these poems, now look, I, I can see that there, there's a space where very bizarre things could happen that were in a more surreal sort of thing. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So th there were a couple more that, were that they didn't make it into the book. And, um, so this is called um, Dreams from the Malaria Pills, and in parentheses, Turner, at Forward Operating Base Eagle. Mm -hmm. This time, it's beautiful. He's in the kelp bed somewhere off the California coast, floating where the green leaves touch the sun. As if he's disentangled from thought itself, as if the mind has come this far, up from the depths to, rele to release him to the crests and shallows, drifting wave by wave back to shore. He knows there are bombs washed up on the beach. There are limbs of people he has never met, bandages soaked in blood and salt. He knows the Quran and the Bible have washed page by page to shore, their bindings stripped loose, their ink blurred to the sea. And if people are crying there, wading out in the surf to carry it all in, back in, then he hasn't seen them yet. The ocean sounds in the bones of his skull, and the albatross fly reconnaissance over the waves, searching for a route home. Thank you. It's one of those rare notes where I was thinking about home. I try not to do that. So since I actually were able to see the audience fairly well, I, I thought I would ask the audience a question. So how many of you have seen the film The Hurt Locker? So, okay, so a lot of hands going up. So uh, this question is for Brian. Um, we've all pretty much become familiar with that term, probably most of us, because of that film last year. Um, can you read to us your poem, The Hurt Locker, and tell us about the first time you heard that phrase? Sure. Um, nothing but hurt left here. Nothing but bullets and pain and the blood out slumping and all the fucks and goddamns and Jesus Christ of the wounded. Nothing left here but the hurt. Believe it when you see it. Believe it when a 12-year-old rolls a grenade into the room or when a sniper punches a hole deep into someone's skull. Believe it when four men step from a taxi cab in Mosul to shower the street in brass and fire. Open the hurt locker and see what there is of knives and teeth. Open the hurt locker and learn how rough men come hunting for souls. You know, when I was, um, it was in August of 2004, and I was up in Mosul in the northern part of Iraq. Well, not in Kurdish, northern Iraq, or first then, the, um, but just before that. It's a large city, and we, we were um, mostly based out of there. But we were sent at one point for a few weeks to a small, um, there was an Almabadi um, outside of there, probably pronouncing it correctly. Um, and while we were there, um, it was just a platoon holding down a company-sized base. So basically, anybody watching us, and there were professional soldiers that we were fighting against. You know, they fought, Many of them had fought against the Iranians, and they, they know the, the, the soldiery, the skills of the soldier. So we're fighting against many professionals. So they could tell that, that we can't exert power hours. That we're basically just holding the base. So they, they attacked us quite a bit while we were there. And um, I remember one was frustrating because there were like roadside bombs and you know, mortar attacks and all these sort of like snipers and Tusha rockets flying over. And it, it was never like a force-on-force a -force kind of battle, which I'm sure we would not have wanted if it had happened. But at the same time, there was kind of a frustration with the oblique nature of it all. I remember my boss, the, the squad was off doing something at one point, and he walked up to me and we were talking, and he said, uh, he was talking about those we were fighting against, and he said, uh, and sometimes I just want to put them in the hurt locker. You know? And I, it was just a weird phrase, it stuck in my head, you know. And then you know, about two weeks later, I wrote this poem. And so I hope you don't mind, kind of, I'll try not to ramble too much, but he, um, I, was, I was contacted by a um, New York Times reporter who asked me about the phrase and said, you know, because when the, when the movie was put up for an Academy of Foreign Awards, um, the, 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 the guy who wrote the screenplay, Mark Bowles, who's a journalist, had been embedded with a unit in Iran 
sergeant from the union said he was going to get a lawyer and sue him because they were using his phrase. Right? So she was doing a job and like researching this because she found, you know, this book came out before I get back. So like, well, where did this come from? Which was she was trying to figure out. I said, I didn't make it up, my squad did it. So I said, let me email him. I emailed him, and can we cuss here? Oh, we I just did it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he, I quoted back to her his response, which was, um, yeah, shit just comes out of my mouth. <laughs> but um, you know, he, he self admits that he's inarticulate, but the thing is that sometimes he mangles language so well that it's you know, impossible mm. to forget. You know? It's very uh, memorable. And I think what it was is at West Point, I've heard some of the officers talking. When they get in trouble, they have to go to the hurt box, do push-ups and stuff. Uh -huh. So, uh, but she found, to finish the story, she found in a small Texas newspaper around 1966, uh, was the first time it was used in print, talking about local football games and a war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> well, David, let's get inside your writing head a little bit. <laughs> Um, Brian has said earlier in an interview, and I'm going to quote for a minute, as I look over America, there is a kind of silence around writing about the war that people, including many artists, feel they don't have the authority to write about war unless they have experienced it firsthand. And yet, for you, in every seed of the pomegranate, your first book, your first book? Second. Second book, excuse me. You have um, ingeniously and compassionately written about the experience of war, giving voice not only to U.S. and Iraqi soldiers, but to children, mothers, booksellers, and other civilians affected in both countries. So tell us, uh, as a writer, how did you find that voice of authority within you, and what drew you to this topic, even though you have not been a soldier? Mm -hmm. um, voice of authority sounds way too much. Uh, <laughs> um, it's more like groping in the dark, and um, kind of by necessity. Since I teach at a community college over in Santa Cruz, um, I found my students who were vets beginning to talk about their experiences. I had one in a screenwriting class struggling to try and talk about his experiences because he was in the green zone. He actually didn't see much combat. He felt guilty and, uh, and yet he had friends who hadn't died. Um, so I guess I saw my vet students struggling to figure out how to reintegrate uh, with a culture that says it honors them but didn't really want to hear many stories. And I just felt, um, I guess that I needed to understand more, that what I read in newspapers didn't really get me very far. Um, when the first poem came out, it actually was in the voice of an angel, and, um, and it, was, yeah, it was writing in the dark at four in the morning in a journal. Um, and I shared it with my group, and my group said, what is this about? And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, you're not done yet. Whatever, you just opened up, and you have more to say. Um, and I've written probably three or four, I've, I've been teaching documentary films, I've been watching a lot of movies about Iraq, I've been reading uh, some about the war, but it really was, when I started writing the poem, I thought, what am I doing? And actually, mm. Brian came to town, read from uh, Phantom Noise and Your Bullet, and then after doing that, we had some drinks and talked, and I said, I'm, I'm starting this crazy project. I really shouldn't be doing this, I don't know where Arabic, I've never been to Iraq, never been to the military. Mm. And he said, if you're starting to respond to it, then you need to because two citizens aren't willing. Um, so I guess then it became, I really have to understand this better. And once I began to read accounts of the soldiers and talk to my students about what they were going through, I realized I couldn't just tell that half of the story. But if I'm gonna make me mad to believe, to try and put words to a soldier's point of view or a civilian in the US's point of view, I have to be able to go further and figure out uh, what an Iraqi soldier or Iraqi kid on the street mm -hmm. might feel. And that was a lot harder to find the information about. Mm -hmm. um, the soldiers were willing to talk. I, I had two Iraqi students, so I had a little bit of that. Um, and I, I would go online and read blogs and um, go back and read Iraqi poetry and try to get a feel for the culture. But for me, it's, it's this ongoing, when you say voice of authority, I think just the opposite. I feel like I am this um, 
it's like groping in the dark and trying to get it, and it's really nice when somebody comes back and says, yeah, that one works. Um, but I feel like it's like an educational experience that just keeps going. Mm -hmm. So every time I meet a vet and uh, I meet an Iraqi, uh, I have a friend here, Sitar Alami, who I had to contact because I said, I can't pronounce the Arabic. I'm writing this stuff. I'm, at some point, I'm going to have to read it. Um, so a lot of it is the ongoing. And I hope it never becomes authority. It becomes um, knowing a little bit more. And, 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 it's, and it's still a tiny fraction. But there's something about this writing and these stories that it's drawing you in and that you feel compelled um, to follow up with your writing. Am, am I understanding what you're saying? Oh, very much. Um, I'm always telling my students to, they have to imagine themselves into other situations. They have to take on the voice of somebody um, whose argument they detest, but they have to understand that point of view if they're going to argue against it. And I guess I feel like the same thing is true for our country. If we are going to send people as warriors into other countries, we have to not only try to understand them as much as we can, listen to them when they come back, but we also have to understand those countries and what we're doing to them. And to not do that, I think, means we really, um, the soldiers can't be the only ones. Soldiers and soldiers' families can't be the only ones that hold that burden. We have to all, in some ways, uh, take whatever we can. Thank you. So let's talk about poetry itself. So if poetry is not therapy, per se, do you feel that poetry can be a, sort of a bridge back to mental health for returning vets? And do you recommend that vets write about their experience? Um, if that works for them, yes. <laughs> if um, you know, dancing works, I, I think for every bet it's going to be different. What outlet is going to be useful for them? Um, and for some, writing is going to be a useful tool. But I think just being able to find what works for you. Um, my vet students have such different needs. And um, some want to tell me privately and want to never mention in the classroom again. Mm -hmm. And other ones really need to process and talk about it and sometimes even confront other students. Um, so, yeah, I would say whatever works. It's a really difficult transition. And, and in so many cultures, warriors were honored when they went out, but then when they came back, there were rituals involved with dealing with that what they had to go through. Sometimes it was separation from the rest of society, cleansing rituals. Um, I don't think we're very good. You know, you don't just come back and, and switch from soldier to civilian, and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a very good way to work through that yes. in a way that honors those, those uh, the tremendous things that gone through. Yes, that transition. So, um, for your, your writing classes with vets, you're not, at this point in time, you're not teaching a class that is for vets per se. These are people who uh, show up in your class and, and then you discover through their writing. Yeah, we have uh, around 150 vets now at Cabrillo. Um, and now that I've been working with vets and I you know, work in the vet center some, um, I get more vets finding their way into my classrooms. Um, but no, no specific class for vets at this point. Okay. Can I ask you to read The uh, Unknown Soldier? Sure. Please. Um, this is based uh, on a photograph. Actually, it was, it was uh, in Kuwait War. And a journalist took this photograph. And it's a photograph of a uh, burned Iraqi soldier, yeah, entirely charred. Uh, you can just see the, the teeth, very white teeth, and his blackened face. Um, and well, I'll just read the, the inscription. This is Ken Jiraki's inscription beneath this photo of this Iraqi uh, incinerated body. And he wrote this actually on the photographs so in his handwriting. If I don't photograph this, People like my mom will think war is what they see on TV. 
And I found that picture before I started writing this book. Um, it was actually on the back page of uh, Adbusters, the Canadian magazine. Um, and it, it bugged me and it bothered me, and I put it in a file drawer someplace. It's not like I wanted to see it, but I also felt like I didn't want to throw it away. And I guess that it came back uh, as I was working on this and trying to think of, um, I use a lot of names in here, and names of actual soldiers, both Iraqi and, and in the US. Um, and I was thinking about also all those, the ghosts of all those who have no name. So this is Unknown Soldier. I burn, am not burned away. Ash against a wall, I don't wear a name. Look at my charred flesh, so unrecognizable, you're suddenly chilled. These lips, seared away from teeth, leave me grimacing at each passerby. Salt stiff sentinel to what we'll all become. Look where eyes used to be. I don't want pity or words. I want you to tear yourself to pieces. Thank you. Such a powerful piece. So this seems like a pretty good segue into talking a little bit about PTSD. We hear a lot about PTSD as the crushing legacy of war. And Brian, many have said that your poem from your second book, Phantom Noise, at Lowe's Home Improvement Center, in which a box of nails hitting the ground sounds like firing pins to the speaker, who's clearly suffering from PTSD is one of the best poems ever written about PTSD. So would you read this poem for us and tell us a little bit about your own experience with PTSD? Um, sure. Don't worry, guys. This isn't going to get too, uh, I'm not going to drop and roll and you know, say everybody down or anything like that. <laughs> it will be all right. But uh, um, it, it was when I, I went into Lowe's Home Improvement Center, it wasn't exactly the sound. It was really the. Um, just the, you know, because they have lots of, so many boxes of nails, you know, like six feet tall, and the rows like 30 feet long, and, and I'm looking for some type of nail, but then I came across this type that had double, double headed nails, and, and they look a lot, a lot like the firing pins, those in the weapon, the weapon I carry. So, um, so then I, I, I went back to my car, I got a notebook, I went back inside and started taking notes, because I realized the poem was saying it was announcing itself, you know. And uh, this one guy walked up to me and he said, uh, it's pretty funny, you've heard me say the story. Right? Yeah. He walks up to me and he says, um, he's like, well, so when you work on a building plaster, do you know how to, and I was like, uh, I'm a poet, dude. It's <laughs> 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 like the last thing you expected me to respond to. You know? <laughs> so, but you know, I needed to get the, the tools that I needed for this poem, you know, so. Uh, at Lowe's Home Improvement Center, Standing in aisle 16, the hammer and anchor aisle, I bust a 50-pound box of double-headed nails open by accident. Their oily bright shanks and diamond points like firing pins from M4s and M16s. In a steady stream, they pour onto the tile floor, constant as shells falling south of Baghdad last night, where Bosch kneeled into the chain guns of helicopters stationed above, their tracer fire a synaptic geometry of light. At dawn, when the shelling finally stops, hundreds of bandages will not be enough. Bosch walks down aisle 16 now, in full combat gear, improbable, worn out from fatigue, a rifle slung at his side, his left hand guiding a 10-year-old boy who has seen what war is and will never rid it from his head. Here, Bosch says, take care of him. I'm going back in for more. Sheets of plywood drop with the airy breath of mortars the moment they crack open and shrapnel. Mower blades are just mower blades, and the Troy-built self-propelled mower doesn't resemble a Black Hawk or an Apache. In fact, no one seems to notice the Casualty Collection Center, Doc High, marks out in ceiling fans, aisle 15. Wounded Iraqis with IVs sit propped against boxes as 92 sample Paradiso fans hover in a slow revolution of blades. 
The forklift driver over adjusts, swinging the tines until they slice open gallons and gallons of paint, sienna dust and lemon sorbet and ship's harbor blue pooling in the aisle where Sergeant Rampley walks through, crate carrying someone's arm, uh, sorry, carrying someone's blown off arm, cradled like an infant, handing it to me, saying, hold this, Turner, we might find who it belongs to. Cash registers open and slide shut with the sound of machine guns being charged. Dead soldiers are laid out at the registers on the black conveyor belts, and the people in line still reach for their wallets. Should I stand at the magazine rack reading Landscaping with Stone or the Complete Home Improvement Repair Book? What difference does it make if I choose tumbled travertine tile, baracino marble, or black absolute granite? Outside, palm trees line the asphalt boulevards. Restaurants cool their patrons who will enjoy fireworks exploding over Bass Lake in July. In San Jose, the lights and the stars rise up over the poetry reading as people gather to listen. Aisle number seven is a corridor of lights. Each dead Iraqi walks amazed by Tiffany posts and Bavarian pole lights. Motion activated incandescents switch on as they pass by, reverent sentinels of light, welcoming them to Lowe's Home Improvement Center, aisle number seven, where I stand in mute shock, someone's arm cradled in my own. The Iraqi boy beside me reaching down to slide his fingertip in retro colonial blue and interior latex before writing T for tourniquet on my forehead. So when I read that poem, I often ask, um, you know, could we be bleeding as a country and we don't even know it? I think it's, I, I, well, that's how I see it. It's, it's a tricky thing. You, you have, um, you know, a lot of the, the women that come back to our classes, the veterans, um, a lot of them are very difficult to, to see if they don't self-identify themselves as veterans. And we have tens of thousands, waves of American women veterans coming home. And uh, I'm interested to see that the work that, hopefully they'll take your classes and mine, and, and they'll, and yours, and they'll, and they'll we'll, 10 or 15 years from now, or five years from now, maybe we'll learn a different, um, a different voice about combat. Because mm -hmm. they're fully, they're, fully in combat, and, um, and I'm already seeing some of it, you probably have too. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I'm drifting out there. But, uh, right. so, <clears throat> do, do you know what PTSD was before it was PTSD? Tell us. Shell shock. Shell shock. Shell shock. What was it? There was another one before that too. Delayed stress syndrome. Delayed stress. It was also battle fatigue, right? Uh -huh. Cowardice for some, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, do you know what it was in the American Civil War? It was called a, a soldier's heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, kinda, I, I like the humanity of that phrase, but I like that PTSD also recognizes um, family members who are involved in the, sort of the umbrella of trauma. So, so now I'm gonna ask you, this question is for both of you, and um, it, um, it's a huge question. So I'm gonna throw the question out there, and, and you just grab the piece that, um, that you respond to. So I'm going to ask the question, and then I'm going to tell you why I'm asking you this question. That's a test. So <laughs> why is she asking this question? So uh, how well are our sons and daughters prepared for what they will encounter as a troop member? And what can we do to support the re returning troops that will help them with their transition back into a more mundane, for lack of a better word, life, is there anything we can do to diminish the serious depression and the suicide rate that follows our vets? So that's so that's the that's the huge question, and the reason that I'm asking you is because we hear a lot on the television, on the news. We hear from therapists, we hear from doctors, we hear from the military. But I would like to know, what do poets say about the healing of our beds? <laughs> yes, that is a huge, huge question. Um, I think there's a danger in our country, both in terms of the way our military is being formed, um, so that if you exclude the draft, you're going to find people going into the military. It's, it's more rural. It's often more southern. Um, seen it as an opportunity. Seen it as a place to get educated. Um, 
if the military data doesn't reflect the wider culture, I think there's a way in which you're a bit disengaged. And I think it, it, it works too. So my soldiers say, I come back and the things I want to talk about aren't what other people want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess it's great to have systems in place and therapists getting better techniques. Um, but I still think it's really crucial that all of us listen to whoever comes willing to talk um, and, just, and just give ear to that vet and, and their needs. Um, I guess I, I feel like that's the, the first step yeah. is that we, we pay attention and we try to educate ourselves a little bit. So being listening yeah. and being aware. Well, I'm just saying, did you, did you, was the word healing in there, with healing? Healing. Is that the word you used? Healing, yes. For the question. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not sure that that actually happened, or mm -hmm. that it should. I know that's not really, I mean, that's what I would want for people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But um, I, I was talking with Eric earlier today about this, um, and it's just, it's a really conflicted, it's, I'm a word I'm very, it's a word I'm very conflicted about with, with why. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like we have to find ways to integrate the experience we have and learn to live with it. So hopefully we can, you know, like, like me, I've been very lucky, fall in love and get married. We have two cats. We live in Orlando, you know. Um, that didn't, wasn't expected for me. You know, I'm trying to figure out a way to live life, a good life, um, mm -hmm. moving forward. But I'm not, I just don't know what the word, the word itself here. Yes. You know? that, that, it's a good question. It's a great mm -hmm. question. It's a serious question. There's, some, there's a few practical things I've seen people doing around the country. Like down in um, San Diego, I know there's a, a couple of, there's a, a couple that's working with um, married folks who are in, in the service. So one, one of them or both of them are deploying overseas. So they're, instead of waiting for them to come back from a deployment, they're trying to talk to them before they go and get them some tools and let them sort of, as a, the psychological tools as they move forward through the process and then come back. Um, and it's, I think that, that sounds to me like a, a worthy project to try to create structures like that, um, maybe around the country. Um, I, I think um, the, the rituals that you talked about, there's no real ritual coming back. Right? You sign out, you turn your gear in and stuff like that. It's sometimes there's a band playing and you know some balloons and family readiness group shows up and gives you cakes and cupcakes and stuff. But um, you know, you, the old warriors, when they would come back like in Vietnam, they would stop short of the city. The cleansing ceremony they referenced, or, you know, the many like it, but um, one of them would take, the warrior name was removed and they, they were given back their name and came back in. Mm -hmm. I did a, uh, I did a, um, a sweat lodge one, at one point. That was very meaningful for me. But again, it's, it goes back to finding ways to listen and then maybe help facilitate possibility for them. Because mm -hmm. somebody's going to want to strip and varnish a bubble. You know, <laughs> like, dance, like you said, you know, and, and maybe they're not verbal, it's just not their thing. You know? yeah. And, and maybe it's also finding those rituals. Um, a vet that I, I met in New Hampshire when I was doing a reading, uh, he was talking about his experience as I sat in on, on, on his talk, uh, John Turner. And he works for the, uh, the, the, uh, he works for the um, uh, Combat Uniform Project, uh, where they take uniforms, and, and he now works with other vets, and they shred their own uniforms and they turn them into paper. And, he got involved with that because he was on tremendous medication when he came back, multiple antidepressants. And he heard that the military was trying to develop a uh, drug that would stop dreaming uh, mm -hmm. so that he wouldn't have nightmares. And he just went cold turkey. He said, I want my nightmares. Even if they're nightmares, I need them. And what he did is he got involved in this uh, combat paper making project. And he says, you know, that's the best thing is for work with other vets. For him, that's what's helping him. He also has uh, I fell in love and had a child now. But his dream is to go back, take the combat uh, paper making project, and go to Iraq and work with mm -hmm. Iraqi soldiers. Mm -hmm. And can you imagine shredding both uniforms mm -hmm. and creating paper out of that? That's what I was just going to go. I was thinking, um, and, and you've alluded to this a couple times tonight, which is already talked about it, that at some point it seems cultural that we as a group of people need to create bridges with people in Iraq and Afghanistan, for example, to. Uh, to try to share our stories, and, you know, varnish boats and fix boats, or whatever it might be. There's some, um, there's some, uh, there's a group that's doing uh, mountain biking, mm -hmm. and some hiking trips with uh, mm -hmm. Iraqi youth up in the, up in the northern part of Iraq. Um, and I think the cross cultural, and cross country kind of things like that are really important for those who are able to do that. Some will never want to go back again. You know, to, you know. 
Well, thank you so much for um, being brave enough to tackle that giant <laughs> question. It's an important question. You have both written uh, so eloquently and yet so starkly about the personal suffering on both sides of the war. And David, you have written a remarkable poem, The Black Camel, that weaves three voices together, the voice of an American soldier, an Iraqi colonel, and the angel of death. So you know I'm going to ask you if you would please read it. Well, um, yeah, it's funny how poems come about. I thought I finished my book. Brian thought it was okay. Um, but that was more than okay. But I, had, <laughs> but I had a series of scraps that I wasn't willing to let go of. And I started to try and bring them together. And when I showed it to my poetry group, um, they said, God, it sounds like these are not just scraps. This could be a story. And so this is the last poem I wrote when I was writing the book. Um, and um, the, the book has voices of soldiers and civilians who are in the US, and they're on the left-hand margin. And then they have um, voices of Iraqi soldiers and civilians on the right-hand margin. And then the middle, the things that are centered are the angels' voices. Um, and I thought the angels are some kind of mediator between these. And so this is one of the few poems where you actually get those three voices um, working at the same time. Um, and this came out of actually uh, contacting some people. So I was reading about one soldier here in Austin, and uh, he died in Iraq. And um, the things I was writing about kind of matched up with his, some of his experiences. And so I contacted his mother and um, sent her the draft of the poem. And she said, use his name, I'd be honored. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Iraqi man, this is really the, his story, and this is a, a wonderful collection of interviews that Mark Kirkus did uh, when he was a reporter. And he interviewed many Iraqis. So these are actual two interwoven stories, but the, the facts are basically there from these lives. Um, and if it's OK, Brian, can you take on the voice of the angel? Perhaps. And then uh, Sitar, if you want to come up and do the uh, Republican Guard Colonel Mohammed Hamid. And now you're going to have to say it better than I can. Uh, this, is, this is my, um, Sitar has been a great help for me in terms of uh, both looking at the manuscript and, and making sure I actually got my references right, um, and then teaching me how to pronounce um, all the things that I put in here. He's doing well for a part time student. <laughs> Um, the Black Camel. So um, this is Malach Almut, Azrael, the Angel of Death. Uh, I will take on the voice uh, from Texas. Lance Corporal Aaron Austin. And this is Republican Guard Colonel Sam. Muhammad Hamid. And it starts off with an Arabic saying, Death is the Black Camel that kneels before every door. No one has been here before you. No one will come after you're gone. I carry your pick inside my helmet. You're my lucky ace of spades, Tiffany. Come spring, I aim to be home and slip that rock on your hand. Barracks were a wreck. Men were rooted in everything. Guns, chairs, even cots. I threatened to shoot. One walked the ice with me on the granite. Why do such a thing? Metal coffee cans are stuffed with bolts, nails, even Iraqi coins cut into star-shaped chunks. Some get detonated by remote-controlled cars. The mass of flies, the mass of flies lifts, restless as a scoot past the dead bodies bloat. Don't cling to one form. Water continues to flow after the pot breaks. American stored the small Quran from my wife's neck. Made me burn it. Grilled the Twinkies you sent. They laughed, but New Mexico and you were right here. I don't ask for much. My tea shop, come customers. Our good wives at home. My son wanted more. Work for Americans, told them what Iraqis said. 
We asked a farmer, face darkened by his raised spade, if he'd seen any foreign fighters. Ali, our Iraqi Turk, laughed and then translated, Yes, you. Ali wore a mask, like a criminal, but the Mujahid still knew. Blood, frogs, lice, wild beasts, moraine, boils, thunder and hail, locusts and darkness. The RPG slammed into the Humvee's windshield but didn't explode. Derek took the wheel because I got jittered. Big old bomb point in my face. The slaughter of firstborns, glass mingled with fire, will fall, break Angel's harp strings. Didn't feel a thing, just a pain in my ears. I looked, and Derek, and where he'd been, was just gone. Scarved men were dragging Ali through glass shards. I made them take me to where it happened. Frenzy of soldiers answers. The Turk's old man stood still as a deer while soldiers hung, picking up the pieces. Blow blood through the tire track, filled over with dust, nipple in a tear of wind. The IED hit while I held his cigarette. Where is God, Tiffany? Blood dried on my lip, but it wasn't mine. Didn't wash it off for days. The more waiting room monitor the school through faces of the dead. May, June. Swore I saw my son, but when they showed me, I cried for a stranger boy. If it does not hurt, nothing will grow. Pierce your tongue, spot ground with blood, pray. Blood on the letter ripped apart in Derek's gear. Dear sis, I never... I still hope to find his body, buried. <clears throat> Black and O'Neill years before, every door. But why take our eldest son soon? Love has no taste in war. These sandals were made only for you, but now I place them in the fire. Thank you. Thank you. Respect and homage to this loss. Uh, 
So anyways, I'm, I'm walking through the snow. It's late at night, two, three in the morning or something. And I'm point man this night. And I, so sometimes I, I turn around and see the soldiers following behind me. You see their silhouettes with night vision goggles on and all our gear and we're just quiet. I'm thinking about the tracks in the snow and the dogs up ahead. And I remember thinking, you know, the reason this is a park is because these are the ruins of Nineveh. Yeah. And so the, the, the oral tradition shifted here where I was walking. Um, to the to the written word and stone and, and tablets and, and you know cuneiform you know um, on, on uh, papyrus rolls and stuff. So you know when I finished high school in Madera, California, I remember writing a list of books I should have read, and one because I thought I'd been educated. And one of them was the Gil the Epic of Gilgamesh. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was walking where that this is where it comes from this this land. You know, poetry. I mean, I'm a poet, and here's where poetry. And this is one of the wellsprings. Um, so to think in Baghdad, you know, this great city of, of in the world history, to have where the books, they have a bookseller street where uh, something so tragic could happen. And tragedy has struck again and again there, mm -hmm. um, even recently. Just this, uh, so they're shutting down stalls and basically trying to clear it out. So there's a, a stamping of, you know, it's like a censorship that's taking place. Um, so it feels important to, to share the poem. Sorry, I'm so long, I didn't know. <laughs> And the other thing is I, I started writing the poem and then I realized I didn't know enough about the street so I started to go online and read more about the street and started to realize what a wealth of uh, voices and cultures were there on the street and, and their political discussions and their books in many languages. It was incredibly rich. I mean, people talk about it as kind of the intellectual, vibrant heart of Baghdad. Um, and... Um, the necessity of listening to those other voices, other cultures you may not agree with, um, seems so crucial and something we do less and less. Mm -hmm. I, even now, I'm trying to research uh, and, and find out uh, some Iraqi voices. I had to go on the Amazon.com UK site to find some books because they're not published in the US. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a real uh, painful gap mm -hmm. in, in our ability to stretch ourselves. Um, so I, I guess part of it is honoring that is because it is such a crucial, yes. uh, was such a crucial thing, it, it really has been kind of shut down. And the other thing that happened for me is when I started looking into it, I found that there was a, um, the Broadside Project was the first anniversary when they did uh, poetry, broadsides were put out, uh, Iraqi poets and U.S. poets in England other places. Um, and now they've just done a series of art books, there's 280 of them. And um, so I applied and said, I'll, I'll make an art book. I'm working on one. And what I ended up making was my book uh, open to the page where this poem is with uh, facing translation that Sitar helped work on uh, in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And then I charred it and hung it from the ceiling like the wings of a, mm -hmm. of a charred bird. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and now that's been, it's going around doing various exhibits um, and uh, complete set of those art books are have now gone to the Baghdad Library. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went back in 2010 uh, with National Geographic to write a story and I, I walked down the street, no longer a soldier, but dressed like pretty much like this jeans, hanging out this shirt, t-shirt and a jacket. And I went into the, the cafe there and you can see the photos on the wall of uh, the man's sons, his sons he lost. A very famous cafe, the, the Shabando Cafe. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, and you know, you could hear the clink of tea, mm -hmm. the glass, you know, the stir of the glasses, and you hear conversation. There was a, a philosophy student. I looked over on his paper. I didn't know he was a philosophy student, but he was scribbling madly as philosopher students worldwide do, right? He's scribbling madly, but in English, and I'm interested. That's what he was studying. He's like, ah, I'm studying, and he was talking about the different uh, philosophers that he was intrigued by. There was a biology professor across the room, and I went over and sat and talked with him. 
and his buddies came around, they were different teachers. It seemed like it was the middle day, like they should have been teaching at the time, but they were, you know. <laughs> and they argued about, so, I don't know, it's just an amazing place, and to think someone would place a bomb there, you know. The, the Mutunabi Street bombing. In the moment after the explosion, an old man staggers in a cloud of dust and debris, hands pressed hard against his bleeding ears, as if to block out the noise of the world at 11.40 a.m. The broken sounds of the wounded rise in around him, roughened by pain. Buildings catch fire, cafes, stationery shops, the Renaissance bookstore, a huge column of smoke, a black anvil head pluming upward, fueled by the Kita Alagani, Ali Isfahani's Book of Songs, the elegies of Khansa, the exile poetry of Yusuf and al Azawi, religious tracts, manifestos, translations of Homer, Shakespeare, Whitman, and Neruda. These book leaves curl in the fire's blue-tipped heat, and the long centuries handed down from one person to another, verse by verse, rise over Baghdad. As the weeks pass by, sunsets deepen in color over the Pacific. Couples lie in the spring fields of California, drinking wine, making love in the lavender dusk. There is a sweet, apple-roasted smell of tobacco where they sleep, they dream, then wake to the dawn's early field of lupin to discover themselves dusted in ash, the poems of Sulma and Sayyab in their hair, Sadi on their eyebrows, Hafiz and Rumi on their lips. When you wake up, do you have this on you? Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm. 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 Yeah. Two, two of them, they were Yeah. And Erica, where did Erica? She was right there. She knew I was going to point her out. <laughs> <laughs> she has one. Um, Sitara, could we hear the poem first in Arabic? Sure. Thank you. This is Sitar al Lamit. He's from uh, the uh, Monterey Defense Language Institute. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to come and be part of this wonderful gathering. I want to say that uh, I'm honored to be part of David's work. I'm not that a poet writing poems, but I have also good friends who are poems. And uh, I work at the DLI, I teach Arabic now. I've been doing that for about 10 years. Uh, I'm by training a, a physicist. I've been at microchip for 27 odd years. <laughs> I gave up with that trick because I felt there's something in life wanting to do to bridge the gap between communities and nations. And communication is one of them. And I felt, since I'm Arabic and a little bit of English, I could participate in my own role. <laughs> It was a big take up, but that is not my problem. <laughs> uh, then I was honored when David asked me to translate his, his poem, and I attempted to do that. And with my science background, I really didn't do a good job, but I have a very good friend of mine at the, uh, the DLI who were able to help me and produce really good quality poem, Dr. Uh, Ilham, <coughs> who did this, and I am just reading it, and I hope I do as good a job as she did. But uh, I just want to introduce myself here. I'm Sitar Alami. I was born and bred in Baghdad. Uh, I left 41 years ago, so I was one of the fortunate people who was able to escape the tragedies that took place uh, since the 70s. And uh, I uh, still have families there, and of course. I'm married here, and I have kids, and so I feel for both nation. I'm American by naturalization. And, and I'm Iraqi by birth, so I have the obligation to serve both nations, and hopefully we'll end up with cheap oil prices. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to give you a quick a brief about the Arabic language, because that will help you understand the, uh, the poem, how it's written. And the Arabic language has 28 letters, and uh, most of the letters are similar to English, the A, B, C, and there are nasal letters on the M and the Ns, uh, so they're similar. There are some difficult letters called glottal letters, that come from the glot, like a, uh, uh, They are a little bit difficult for my student to simulate, but they do well after uh, you know, plenty of practice. The young one tend to pick it up faster because their vocal cord still have some flexibility, but the older one tend to have a hard time because the scientists tell us that as we get older, 
work of code get harder. It doesn't have much flexibility. So as you could, I could you see what happened to my accent. I lived in the West for 41 years, and uh, my accent is still uh, is not uh, as good as your American accent, but it is uh, the kind of bastardized by the Scottish, the English, and the Iraqi flat, flat tone. Uh, so that is 28 letters in the Arabic language. I won't take too much more time. The vowel is a critical part of the Arabic writing because uh, there are somewhere around about 10 vowels, the, the long vowels and the short vowels. The long vowels are similar to a piano English. The A, the O, and the Ya. Out of these, there are shorter vowels. The A goes E, the Ya goes E, and the, vowel, the O becomes U. And there are double of these vowels. And there is a double vowel called shedde. So there's at least 10 vowels, which make uh, the Arabic language quite uh, kind of rule strict. The, uh, <clears throat> the way there are, the, the term of poems, Arabic poems, there are three types of poems. That is the three main ones. One of them is called al makfa al makfi the ones which end up with a specific consonant or specific uh, diacritic. And all the ending of each phrase has to end up with the same consonant or vowel, and it is critical rule, but you cannot violate it. So it makes it very hard to write, so for that reason it disappears. But the modern uh, poem, which is called Hadith, this is what uh, 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 Dr. David wrote, uh, it doesn't conform to rules. It's a basically a free flow of poetry. And there's another one called the popular poetry, which is well, the street poetry, the street, and what called the vernacular uh, poetry, where people in the street with their own street language. Uh, so now I'm going to read you the uh, poem uh, David wrote, which is uh, thrilling to me because he, he has captured the essence and the picture of wars in my own country. In a war that is very powerful, very attractive, and uh, nobody could paint a picture as good as the picture David painted with his words. So here is how I tra we translated it to English. And it starts with al safahatu al multahibatu tu'mi al absara tashukku atun al jildi al muttabi tatanatharu ashla'an muhtariqatan that is part of the body spread all over the place of the victims. Min jasad al rajuli from the body of the man, min arabatihi from his car or his cart. Tusabiku salawatihi beat his prayers. تَنْثُرُوا فِي الْكُتُبِ Spread all over the books. وَتَعْمَلُوا تَقْطِيعًا فِي الْجَسَدِ Talking about the metal sharp knots, the cut in the body. أَلَّتِي اِحْتَغَنَاتْهَا Which is being hosted by the body hosted the sharp knots. تِلْكَ شَلَائِ The sharp knot. تُشْحِرُوا صَرَخَاتِ التَّوَجُّعِ Create this pain, scream of pain and agony. اللَّا إِنْسَانِيَّةِ The inhumane. الْعَصِيَّةِ عَلَى الْعَدْ Which are difficult to count. من العابرين على الأرصفة for those people who are passing by or passing by وحص الطرقات المشرقة that is the cobblestone of the street تكيل اللعنات على العالية curses the gods وقد أذهلها المعدن they were stunned by this metal by this incident by this explosion أو تفاركها or these stones Bless, but not bless. Uh, the word is you, you basically said uh, <coughs> curse or bless. Right. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Blessing the gods. I guess it's uh, it's a counter reaction, right, to what happened. وَتَمْحُ كَلِمَاتَهُ وَمَضَاتٍ لَا أَجْنِحَةِ أَجْنِحَةَ لَهَا and and this basically erase the uh, the words and the. the uh, signs, and the leftovers, which has no wings. In Arabic, we capture the essence in Arabic. And if, if you are an Arab, you read it, it, it has high level, has deep meaning. Sometimes the uh, translation from English to Arabic is difficult to do one to one mirror English. So you basically translate the meaning of what is being said and try to do it in a way that is uh, sophisticated and uh, kind of has some depth to it. That's all I have for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Latar. Yeah. I hope you don't mind. I know this is unusual, but do you mind reading now that we're here? Can you just read it through just, just the Arabic? Oh, Arabic, okay, sure. No, no English, just, just Arabic. Okay, perfect. I would be very happy to do that. Thanks, Latar. As-safahatul mutahibatu. Please notice the diacritic. No, 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 no. No, just, just Arabic. Oh, just Arabic. Yeah. As-safahatul mutahibatu tu'mil absarat. 
تشق آتون الجلد المتقد تتنافر أشلاء محترقة من جسد الرجل من عربته تسابق صلواته تنثر في الكتب وتعمل تقطيعا في الجسد التي احتضنها تلك الشظايا تشعل صرخات التوجع اللا إنسانية العصية على العد من العابرين على الأقصفة وحصت طرقات المشرئبة تكيل اللعنات على الآلهة وقد أذهلها المعدن أو تباركها وتمحو كلماته ومضات لا أجنحة لها At the bookseller's market, pages turn blinding as if lit from within, skin seared blasting furnace of the man's body and car become burning shards, fly past his prayer and tear into books while shredding apart the hands that held them open, and the body's shrapnel ignites the chorus of cries that follow the path of the blast until the cobbled streets rise up, metal-stung stones cursing or blessing the gods, obliterating his words, flashpoint without wings. Well, we are very close to the end of our time. I do have a couple of questions from the audience, and I'm going to go ahead and ask them, but we're going to be looking for your, um, what do we want to call that, lightning bullet. Ooh, bullet. One more to see how much violence is in our, how much unconscious violence is in our language. It's, it is amazing. So, um, the first question is for Brian. Do you have any advice or words of wisdom for the parents of boys who are fascinated by war and weapons? Um, well, sometimes people ask me to say, uh, well, I have some young, young folks come up to me and say they're thinking about joining the military, you know, what, what, would, they, what would I suggest? And, and I would say, you know, we've been, to be honest, we've been stomping on smaller countries for quite a while now. And um, I think for even a war for a long time, it seems to me I would encourage them. It doesn't seem as adventurous as them, you know, as it maybe actually is. But I, I'd say you know maybe join the diplomatic service. Go in and you know, um, let's say that's not exciting enough. You know? Although you'd be posted in different places around the world. You know? uh, I was an infantry soldier, so when I when I signed the contract, right before I signed the contract, I remember I did a test, a ream of things, and I all these things, all these different jobs I could get. And, um, and this guy was in a cubicle, and he was wearing this really horrible suit, polyester green suit. I didn't want to wear that suit, you know? And, um, and he swiveled. I didn't know my chair swiveled, too. I swiveled with him. And right behind us on the part of the particle board, it was right here. I didn't even see them when I sat down. It was uh, these guys, their faces with camo, and they were, they were going through the water on a Zodiac with their weapons out, and branches hanging down on this creek, you know? And he was like, do you want to do a job like me, or like, <laughs> and I was like, I want to do that, you know, really like cross rivers and stuff. Uh, but I never did. I, I did some pretty exciting. I guess you all put it under the umbrella of adventure sometimes. Um, but what I suggest, I'm sorry it takes so long. Let's say you know, get a degree and go with Doctors Without Borders or something. Mm -hmm. um, get some paramedic training or something. Try and attach to them if you're not a doctor. And uh, find yourself in a, in a Land Rover out in Sub-Saharan Africa with a paper-written map three different languages, a Cuban doctor and a French doctor and you, and the three of you gotta get these medicines out to this village somewhere. If you wanna talk about adventure, that's adventure. But for the seven years, one month, 29 days, I was in the military, I was in combat, but the vast majority of my service was mopping floors like that. I mean, this floor really needs some work. <laughs> I'm the guy for this job, because I've been trained to you know, buff and wax a floor like you do not really have a job. <laughs> I believe you. I do believe you. <laughs> sort of like the old Saturday Night Live back in the day when they said, uh, you know, be all you could be for $99 a month. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot of peeling potatoes and the floor mopping. So, thank you, Brian. And the last question I'll direct it to oh, you. Oh, wait, wait, wait. 
I'm sorry, this is really crucial, and okay. I'm really sorry to do this, mm -hmm. but I would say, fundamentally, you have to be prepared to take someone's soul in the last breath of their life, and is that the kind of world, the kind of life that you want to live? Mm -hmm. You know, and people don't say that enough to, to other people when I'm thinking about joining. They, you get a real look in the eye and tell them hard. Right. But, yeah. and, and I apologize for that. No, so, no apology necessary. I'm just sitting here thinking that's not going to be in any marketing materials or <laughs> literature that is being handed out. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, so we really are uh, running out of time here, uh, but the good news is that um, we're running out of time here in this space, but we're going to move shortly next door to a book signing with David and Brian. So I'm going to ask you both very quickly, what are you working on now? What's next? Um, well, there's one thing I'd like to share with you uh, right here is um, a book that I have a very small part in, a few pages, but I think it's a pretty wonderful book called Fire and Forget. It's a, um, it's, I think it's the first anthology of, of uh, short stories from Iraq and Afghan vets. Mm -hmm. It's put out by an, a writer that I think we're going to see a lot of in the future, a guy named Royce Cram. And Matt Gallagher has a book, Kaboom, that's out there. But, um, they, they were nice enough to have a poet, you know, right? Um, I've got a book called um, uh, The Strangest of Theaters, and that's coming up. But that's more, it's for the poets in, in, in the audience who uh, maybe don't travel outside of the country finding ways to get in a Land Rover and deliver medicines or whatnot and write poems about it. And a, a memoir that I'm working on for next year called uh, My Life as a Foreign Country. My Life as a Foreign Country. Yes. Amazing title. Yes. David. Um, I've got a father who has dementia. He's 84 years old. And so I've been working for a while on a book called Black Ice, which is mm. just starting to feel like it's finished. Um, and then the other thing that's happened that, uh, interesting when the doors open, um, I wanted an Iraqi to write a blurb on the back of my book, so I started contacting various poets, Iraqi poets that I admired. And uh, Adnan al-Sayik, um, he had to leave Iraq because he wrote a book that wasn't um, favorable to Saddam. And so he's in London, but he wrote back and he said, I'd be happy to, I love your poems. And then five months after my book came out, he said, um, I've got these word for word translations, but I'd love to put out selected poems in English. Will you help with that? Mm. So uh, I'm, I'm working on those translations, and I have a tiny one I'll just read. Uh, predicament. Don't tell anyone about your dream, said my father. The street was mined with ears each connected by a concealed wire to another ear until they strung themselves all the way to the feet of the tire. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say thank you very, very much to Brian Turner and David Sullivan for spending some time with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night.